um, yeah, thanks for coming. Um, we, uh, being bombarded myself by um, hundreds of uh, messages inviting me to join um, journals and submit manuscripts and to join editorial boards. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I suggested to Uzi um, and uh, others that it was time we to have a session on predatory journals. Um, obviously we all want to publish, we don't necessarily aspire to having three star publications with everything we publish, but we do want to make sure that we, we don't um, uh, devalue our research by publishing the wrong channels. So um, predatory publishing, you'll all know this, it's exploiting you essentially um, because it suggests that you're going to get the full package that you would expect to get with a, a real journal um, in terms of editorial and publishing services including publicity and, and uh, uh, quality um, and, uh, and they're not delivering. And there are three aspects to this. Um, first of all, it's misleading you. You think there's a legitimate opportunity and you're not. Secondly, they then tell you that there's an article processing fee uh, which I have to say a lot of other open access journals tell you it's in that order, but they sort of spring it more on you. And the most, most important thing, you're wasting your time sifting through emails, deciding should I or shouldn't I, and then if you write an article, then you're wasting your time when you could be publishing in another channel. Um, and the, the sort of first take-home message is even... Even a two-star journal. Two-star journals are good. Uh, several of us are on editorial boards are two-star journals, um, but but a two-star journal trumps um, or beats predatory journals every single time because predatory journals have a bad reputation that can drag you down with it. Um, it's a big business. Um, here's the growth from 53,000 in 2010 around to 420,000 um, in the most recent figures, 8,000 active journals, so there's a lot of noise out there to mislead you. Um, it's still, though, a small fraction of the market. Um, if you think that near 2 million papers get added to PubMed every year, um, then uh, uh, 420,000 is, is, is still um, relatively small, um, but um, it's, it's, it's growing all the time. Um, you have two types of predatory journal. You have the standalone predatory journal where someone's just invented a title. Um, or you have these disreputable publishing companies that could have hundreds of titles. And typically people uh, lie somewhere in between. Um, publishers have between 10 and 99 titles. Um, they lure you in uh, a bit like Vanity Press used to do. You used to be able to get your poems published if you wanted to. You paid for the privilege. I, I did that once as a teenager. Uh, they lure you in and then they tell you that it's $178 to publish, which is low compared with um, uh, um, uh, uh, article processing uh, fees for genuine journals. But the point is that, um, if it, as economists will tell us, it's, it's not about cost, it's about value. And the value of this $178 is zero to you and your professional reputation. Um, the market is estimated as being 74 million US dollars um, out of um, 244 million um, for the whole open access market. But there's an awful lot for them to go after, $10.5 billion, um, and their share is increasing. Um, right. Uh, here's just some background statistics. I'm not going to take you through them all. Number of publishers is going through the roof. The number of standalone journals is, is uh, going up incrementally. And a new phenomenon now, and I'll show you an example of this because it really um, shocked me, hijack journals where you take an existing title that's got a good reputation, it ceases to um, uh, exist under that publisher, and then someone essentially either buys the title legitimately for peanuts and then uh, offers it as a, as a, a apparently legitimate looking journal um, or they, um, they masquerade as the journal knowing that there's no publisher to come after them because they've gone into liquidation. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Right, okay, so what does this look like to, to, to you? In fact, this is a hijacked journal. Um, the first thing that you can spot, and I'm sorry that the graphics aren't particularly good here, the first thing is that they, they, you would tend to get an email from a, an automated looking journal email. So it will have something like the initials of the journal title and then the publisher. It's not personalised, um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, it's got a bit of spin there, it's a, an author-centred review process 
which is normally completed in eight weeks. Um, good journals compete on quality, not time. So um, just because, I mean, you want good quality journals to process your manuscript quickly. The BMJ makes a big virtue of this, but you don't choose your journal just because it's quick. It's a bit like um, choosing, choosing your food because it can be done in 30 seconds rather than having a, a roast or a whatever. Um, the second thing is it says our charges among the lowest in the field of open access publishing. Again, it's sort of selling you the advantage of being cheap. Again, cheap is not a good marker for um, quality. And then the third thing, uh, uh, it's not third thing, fifth thing here um, that's important, you can usually spot these, and it's almost foolproof. Any journal that tells you a deadline is um, actually encouraging you to submit now. Um, uh, reputable journals are going to be around a long time. They don't require you to submit by a particular deadline. The only exception is special issues. Um, and I'll come to special issues in genuine journals otherwise. But if it, essentially, if they have a date, it's almost a 100% positive marker. It's predatory. That doesn't mean to say all predatory journals will have a date. But if it has a date, it's usually um, predatory. And this is a hijacking. Uh, I, I, did, I checked back because I was very surprised to see this predatory journal was indexed in SINAL, which you'll be aware is the Nursing and Allied Health Literature Database. Um, and when I checked the list of journals indexed by SINAL, it turns out that this journal title was previously owned by Radcliffe Publishing, quite a reputable small um, publisher um, based in Oxford. Um, that, that, that their journal's operation went out of business about um, five or six years ago, and so they're masquerading as that journal, and they're telling you that they're indexed in SINAL. Um, I checked, and it's no longer in, indexed in, in SINAL, but if you were to search for that journal, you'd get the old results under the previous publisher. So very crafty, really. Um, uh, another thing here, where we've got some similar things here. Journal of Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. Again, an automated um, email. Um, uh, uh, usually the salutation, yes, I should have said that on the previous one. That one was addressing me in the nice personalised form of dear Dr. A. Booth at sheffield.ac.uk, which sort of suspects it's not really a nice person, sort of, uh, who's really impressed with my journal, uh, my, my article submissions. Here, dear, dear Dr. Andrew Booth, um, slight refinement, there's nothing particularly wrong with that, but actually if you were writing a letter properly, you'd either say Dear Andrew or Dear Dr. Booth, um, but again they're using some sort of mail merge, so it's suggesting it there. Um, greetings from the journal, then impact factor, asterisk. Asterisk is their way of saying it's not a proper impact factor. Um, uh, the journal citation stuff is all owned by, t t owned by Thomson Reuters now. In the past it was owned by the Institute of um, Scientific Information and um, they were very proprietary about their impact factor. It was big business. They were the only company who did it reputably. Um, they were very litigious. If you put impact factors on your, your own website, so if I did that for the university, a list of them, they would come after me and ask me to take them down. So um, the protection that these companies put in is that they put an asterisk there with no footnote, which tells you what the asterisk means, but um, on their website and on the email, it's saying that they're using an alternative form of citation, not the web of knowledge one. So that's another marker, okay? Um, again, we've got the date. Um, a little bit of buttering up here in regard with your, in regard your busy schedule, so poor, poorly written English, another telltale sign. And um, uh, they are asking me to submit my submission to the editorialmanager.com, so uh, automated again. Um, the other thing, I did a little bit of detective work. This guy um, who's the uh, editor there um, uh, does exist. Some of them don't, or you can't trace them, but this one does exist. He is in the right field. On his web page, he does credit himself being on the editorial board of a number of editorial journals, uh, sorry, a number of um, alcoholism journals, but doesn't mention this one anywhere. So again, if it was something he was proud of or if he even knew of, then he would um, uh, mention it on his website. So, so superficially, it does look, um, uh, look, look the genuine article, but um, we can still uh, we can uh, probe through it. I mean, it took me about 
five minutes to find this guy's website. If it takes you longer than that, then you can assume that the person isn't as reputable as the, uh, the email suggests. Um, I mentioned misleading metrics. This is from um, the, the, the person, um, uh, Beale, um, Jeremy Beale, I think it is. We'll come to it in a minute. Anyway, as well as having lists of poor, um, predatory publishers and lists of predatory journals, um, standalone journals, he now produces a list of predatory metrics. Essentially, companies who will supply journals with, site, with impact factors. And if you look down the list, again, it's quite difficult to see, but there are several whose initials are ISI, which were the original initials of the bona fide um, way of doing impact factors, um, so they're masquerading. So you've got journals masquerading as real journals, supporting themselves with impact factors from companies who are masquerading as genuine impact factor manufacturers. And you can see how many, I mean, this was only half the page. So um, uh, the, the, the other thing you might see is that some journals um, um, will use um, the Scopus um, impact factors. Um, those um, are becoming more reputable, but they're much more open than the, the, um, uh, the ISI now uh, journal citation reports impact factors. So, so essentially, if, it, if you can find an impact factor in journal citation reports, that is a sign that it's not a predatory journal. Anything else, any other source of impact factor opens up the possibility and uh, if it's beyond Scopus, then it's almost certainly a, a predatory journey. Um, there's, there's a few tools to help us. Um, we can look at uh, the directory of open access journals. You just put the title in there. If it's a bona fide one, then it will appear. Um, uh, that's very easy to use. It's got a very easy uh, um, uh, URL there, doaj.org. Um, uh, this is done from a, an article um, by David Mower, who um, you might know is behind many publication standards like, um, um, uh, like Prisma and Consort. Um, uh, he did an annual um, survey of all the um, emails that he got sent, um, and uh, he uh, produced a frequency table of the publishers. And uh, I thought because... 60% um, of these were just top three publishers. It might be helpful for us all to have in our mind a little trigger or mnemonic that r helps us recognize those publishers. So there's the Omix, which is Omicky oh, Takers, um, Psydoc with a Psy, uh, and Jacobs, who are obviously crackers. So if you can remember those three, if you see any publishing companies, oh, sorry, any emails from publishing companies, from those three, then they're predatory journals. So uh, it's a good way. Of, you could almost set well. You could set that up as a, a filter on your your um, uh, uh, Google Mail anyway. Um, okay. Um, and here is the site of Omix um, International. Uh, they've got a huge um, portfolio of um, uh, 700 plus um, peer-reviewed open access journals. So you're going. That's why you're going to get so many of these. Um, messages. They won't be about the same journal, they will be um, across the range of journals. Um, this is the research they did, about 311 invitations. I don't know how you compare with that. I'm nowhere near that high, but I still get uh, one or two a week. Um, they're enough to irritate me. Um, uh, sometimes the email address will be correct, but the salutation will be wrong, so that's another marker. Um, most of the journals can be tracked on this blacklist of predatory journals, so, so it's very easy to see through them. The, th the, the quick points to look for here, flattering salutations, dear esteemed Dr. Pravash, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, claims that they've read the papers, uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Campbell, they always put a doctor whether you, whether, whether you are or not, so I had hundreds as doctors um, for many years. Um, uh, then they'll say, uh, we, we, we've been very impressed by this paper that you've published. Um, uh, they'll have poor sentence structure and spelling mistakes. That doesn't necessarily mean the predatory journals. They could be um, uh, uh, Shah authors, but um, <laughs> or Shah students, probably more fairly. Um, and the topics of the journals are extremely um, general. Medicine and science, or 
science and engineering. Uh, what you want for your publication is to be in a, in a journal that's got a particular niche, and these don't have a niche, they're trying to swoop up everyone. Um, so, um, what's being done about it? Well, um, hopefully many of you will have encountered this site. This is the sort of the legitimate publisher's strike back, if you like. Um, they've um, produced um, this Think, Check, Submit site, um, which essentially says that all researchers, that's all of us, should go through this three-stage process before selecting our journal, okay? And um, they've done a nice little video, which I'm going to take two minutes of your time to show. Technology permitting. So it's quite a simple process. The checking isn't, you know, requiring a lot of technical knowledge. It's a few of the key things. Um, hopefully, the emails that I've shown you sort of have sort of given in a concrete form what the approach will look like. Whoops. <laughs> Not intended. I have as well. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, hopefully, the the um, the emails will give you. Um, uh, a picture of what the approach will look like. That's given you a, a strategy, if you like, for very quickly checking uh, what uh, um, uh, what the credentials of the journal are. Um, this is the extended version from the same site of that checklist. Um, uh, the indexing and abstracting obviously is a big attraction because people are more likely to find things if they are in legitimate um, uh, databases. Um, but essentially, uh, you don't have to check very many of those Essentially, uh, we would be interested in are they in Pub PubMed, are they in Web of Science, or are they in Scopus? And if a journal isn't in those three, then it's unlikely that your colleagues are going to find your article um, other than general uh, Google searches, web pages, etc. Um, uh, you'll see that um, one of the uh, uh, approaches here is that the, the reputable publishers have formed professional organisations. Um, such as the Committee on Publication Ethics, um, the Scholarly Publish uh, Publishers Association. We've already mentioned the Directory of Open Access Journals. So th they're as concerned as this as we are as researchers. Um, this is a wonderful list. It's um, uh, the um, product of an, an individual who gets an awful lot of stick for it because every time you put a journal in there, then of course the publishers or the, their representatives or, or people who pretend they've got nothing to do with the publishers but are uh, lackeys of the publishers challenge the inclusion of the journal in the list. It's made up of a list of publishers and a list of standalone journals. 
don't just check the list of standalone journals because most of the predatory publishers um, uh, publish more than one and so um, you, you'll need to find the journals in their list. Um, here's a little game you can play on a Friday. You can create your own predatory journal. So just, um, Fiona, just pick a word from each column, please. Um, international advances, scientific nursing. Right, excellent. <laughs> Go on. Me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. Sorry. Uh, global innovations in applied medicine. There you are. Um, recent uh, international experimental practice. There we go. <laughs> We've now got um, three more predatory journals. Didn't take very much. I think you got to have Asian advancements in scientific science as. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll kick that in a minute. Um, uh, the, the, the one point here, an important point, is the occurrence of Asian and Indian is, is based both on the origin of many of these journals and in fact the, the target market, the Indian publishing market, is a primary target of predatory journals. Um, partly because of a culture of you know, publish or perish that, that exceeds our own. Um, the, 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 the other thing is that many of the predatory journals do have Indian or Asian, so I've not just sort of picked that out just for, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, not in an arbitrary way. Um, the, the analyses uh, would, would have that there. Um, uh, this is um, a little aid memoir. Um, this is um, a sort of pecking order of journals. It's not infallible, um, but essentially you've got the top big five at the top, and then you've got this cluster of journals that, that are more likely to be legitimate than, than not. Now having said that, I've checked the lists of predatory journals and there are a number of Americans, American Journal of, there are several annals of and archives of, but essentially these, these ones have been around in medicine quite some time. Things like archives of family medicine, um, if, if another journal like that came out then, then they, they, they would, they would um, uh, sue. Um, and then you've got the BMC journals in the middle of the pack, so they're genuine open access, not necessarily as highly cited as, as the paper equivalent yet. They're going that way. And then European Journal of um, can go either way. There's, there's a few journals like European Heart Journal, European Journal of Clinical Pharmacology that are legitimate journals, um, but there's a large number of European journals of that are predatory. So, so that's you know, where the balance is almost 50-50. When you get into the lines of International Journal of, I'm sorry, International Journal of Nursing Studies, I've published in there. I think it's the only one that's got International Journal of in my publications list, but that's be being sort of blackened by all the other International Journals of that appear. And if that's not megalomaniac enough for you, we've now got World Journals of, Global Journals of, I'm waiting to see the first Universal Journal of with mm -hmm. submissions from Martians, I think. Um, and the slide that I had at the beginning, I was going to have a shark gobbling something up, but actually, more appropriately, it's a dolphin because dolphins seem cute, and, um, but underneath the surface, so to speak, they are likely to gobble you up. So this is about masquerading as a predator, uh, a masquerading predator. Um, so it sounds very pessimistic. All of these people after your money trying to get you to publish in the, the wrong channels. So um, to end on a positive note, um, we're not just talking, our school has three star strategies and John Brazier and I have got some tips on how to publish in three star journals, but that's not the audience here. The, the, the audience here is about publishing things you want to get out there and you don't want to get into the wrong channel. The things that we do, uh, eight out of ten of our articles will be of this sort. So um, get to know editors and peer reviewers so that you know them by reputation. They know you and they can advise you on what, what is likely to be published. You can follow them at conferences and things. Um, uh, and make a list of journals that you want to, um, uh, to get your own work into and peer review for them so that you get to know what the expectations are. You, know, you put yourself in the shoes of a peer reviewer. Special issues are a great opportunity because the success rate is about three times better in the same journal for a special issue than it is for an ordinary issue because they do have a time deadline. They do want it to come out. 
Um, I don't know whether this is coincidental, but I've just had a, a, a review article um, on systematic searching published in the journal Systematic Reviews, and that was a special issue on qualitative research. It's possible that it might have taken longer or um, even been rejected if I'd been going for an ordinary issue. Um, look out for new journals um, um, because, again, your chances are uh, at least three times higher, possibly as high as five times higher to publish. Uh, you wouldn't publish uh, in new journals um, for ref purposes because they wouldn't have acquired an impact factor. But for the other things, um, uh, being in a, a, a niche journal, um, I, I remember I was in the fir very first um, uh, issue of Journal of Clinical Excellence and in the very first issue of its predecessor, Journal of Clinical Effectiveness. It was exactly the right place for me. And I, I don't pretend that it was the quality of my work that got in. A lot of it had to do with me writing in the right area and them looking for copy. Um, so I hope it was good enough, but um, they, they were desperate and I was desperate, so it worked for them. <laughs> um, and then uh, finally, um, just a reminder that within the school we have this uh, system, uh, obviously uh, mandatory for, um, for REF publications, um, but suggested for all other publications. Um, just send abstracts through and, and I can look at them and advise you. There are various tools, other members of the library team can advise you on tools that, for example, match your abstract to particular journals. Um, but the important thing of this, this session is to avoid predatory um, um, journals. Um, and it's worked so well for journals that now we're starting to see emails that will invite you for conferences. And just on a twist on this to conclude, Mike Brad Bradburn contacted me today, um, you know, sorry to miss this particular session, but saying that he was now being invited to peer review for predatory journals. Now predatory journals um, uh, usually make a virtue of they publish you very quickly, but obviously they're, they're facing a backlash now, and so they're wanting to look at even more like genuine journals than before. And so, if you like, they're, they're trying to reach out to us and ask us to be peer reviewers, which, which might feel, um, uh, um, it, it might feel uh, prestigious, but in fact, it's, it, again, it's a waste of our time. And um, hopefully this was evidence-based, a couple of references there, um, both on um, the, the survey of um, e uh, um, emails received and on the directions predatory open access is going. So um, I took the full amount there, but we, we have got a couple of minutes if you would like to um, ask any questions or, or indeed your own observations about how these journals are, are working or any tips to be, be aware of. Um, and we just um, wanted to ask you if this has, sort of, thinking of the reviewing side of things, does this have implications for, say, quality assessment or further implications? So thinking that the you know, the, the likelihood that someone's doing, say, a Google Scholar search that wouldn't necessarily pick up, um, you know, you wouldn't, it wouldn't have filtered out um, some of these types of journals that wouldn't, that would be, you know, cited on websites or etc. So, I don't know whether... I just yeah, I hadn't made that connection. Obviously, that's another hat I'm very interested in. We could spend our time um, uh, systematically reviewing poor quality, well, retrieving them and then uh, reviewing them, quality assessing them, making reviews take longer, um, but with no additional benefit or yield. So, so yeah, I mean, um, I've already come across instances under traditional publishing of where, where the same study has been published from two different countries and with the same data in, and that sort of thing. One of the things of predatory journals is because they let things go, People have just submitted streams of gobbledygook and got them um, accepted. Um, but, but because they will accept very easily, um, they don't check for plagiarism either, so that you can actually take someone else's um, work, put your own name to the top. <laughs> Sorry, I don't think you can. <laughs> Please, let's <laughs> rewind. One could, if one was unethical and scru uh, unscrupulous, and, and get yourself credited for lots of um, uh, uh, other authors' articles. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really worrying from that point of view as well. The, the plagiarism check that most reputable publishers will have is omitted so that we will spend more time trying to say, well, which of these is the legitimate one. Um, Ruth Wong and I also found an article recently that was a very quick written article 
not necessarily in a very reputable journal, that took a paper of suggestions on how to make your, your citations more impactful, which was an internal document and a, a version that looks very similar to it has been published um, as a journal article. So someone's taken a, a working paper, if you like, and converted it into a journal article. Um, and uh, so that's another form of predatory behaviour. What do you think most of their motives are? Is it financial or are, are some just being very, very naive and trying to get in, you know, in developing countries and markets, trying to get in, but they're doing it in a very cack-handed, naive way? Yeah, I, I suppose if you were a, a little fish and you got swallowed by a whale, you wouldn't um, worry that much whether it, it was deliberate or an accident. <laughs> um, so I can't speculate that. I, I suspect, as you're, you're implying, that it's, it is a mixture of both, that you've got people who are deliberately being uh, uh, unscrupulous um, because they see uh, an opportunity for fraud, and there are other um, people who see this as a business opportunity of, of providing authors with two things they want, which is things much quicker and things much cheaper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all want that, but whether we're paid to, prepared to pay the cost of, cost of quality in order to achieve that is, is, is mm -hmm. really what this one's about, yeah. Is this something that we kind of teach, do they all should teach to, you know, our PDRs and PGTs? Because obviously they are most susceptible, perhaps, to... So yeah. their career and well, that, that, that's one route. I, I think because of turnover and, and people's different backgrounds and things, it might be more effective to try and get all of the um, supervisors to be uh, publication savvy um, because that helps the supervisors themselves in the long term and the PhDs in the short term. So, so no doubt there's many sort of streams to the the um, uh, strategy, but, yeah. but I, I think I would be happy if, if every supervisor in Shah knew this sort of stuff yeah. and, uh, and then they could warn their PhD students, because very often PhD students will, for quite understandable reasons, involve their supervisors in submission yeah. of work. That, I think that the, more, the water's muddying because we're getting reputable ventures setting up individually that are quality. But obviously yeah. they kind of, they're almost like standalone or getting yes. people publishing on their own or you know, even things like the White Rose platform, these things yeah. appear in a, and it's kind of, I can imagine how confusing it may be to some people. Yeah, and there's tremendous market out there for it. Anyway, I think we'll finish the formal session here because I realise you will have places to go, but if any of you want to have a chat on the way out, then that's fine. We didn't even break into the case. But <laughs> <laughs> I was upset that my fish paper, did you read my fish paper? <laughs> I didn't read your fish paper. Uh, yeah, Andy submitted his own paper paper to the uh, a journal, didn't you? Journal of Fish, Agriculture and Poultry. They contacted me twice. So I sent them 6,000 words that said just fish. But um, I did have references and I did break it up and uh, add a table of fish and things like that. So something fishy is going on there. <laughs> and hence the they never replied. Oh. I actually sent me a going, you just so happens I have just completed something. I am looking for some way to publish it. So here you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't tell the full story from what you yeah. said. But some people have sent whole you know, whole pages of obscenities to journals and got them published. One got published one got published in a legit one though, didn't it? So one did an obscenities and it was published in a, a, a legitimate Well yeah, I don't know if that yes. was a back end of pointing out this problem or something or well, also, um, there is a following tier of um, uh, uh, fraudulent authors that as a subject of a, a paper that showed that eating lots and lots of chocolate was very good for your health was submitted to one of these journals that had been hijacked and, 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 um, uh, and it got picked up by all the, the news things. Obviously, it would do, wouldn't it? You know, so we all want to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have a, have a chocolate brownie on the way out, please. But, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the problem is that you've got this, the, the people who are doing this thing in sort of fraud or whatever, or, or um, you know, cutting quality assurance, you've got people who are then trying to produce manuscripts to catch them out, who are actually, although it's very interesting, they're actually perpetuating the number of manuscripts that are useless, aren't they? So, you know, if you pretend to be a, a, a poacher and you go in and join a journal and send an article to them and it gets published, yes, you've got a nice little case study that you can write up, but on the other hand, you know, there's one more fraudulent paper out there. So.